you just touch that thing and it goes goes to mute. Yeah. <clears throat> We're going to need every moment that we've got this morning, and we'll still have a few people coming in. But uh, uh, what I wanted to do in light of the fact that uh, you've already been being given uh, in-depth, um, high-level scholarship on church history from, uh, from Brother Ken, uh, I wanted to try, to try to at least get close to that level. It's sort of hard for me to do, uh, given all of Ken's years of teaching church history and things like that. Um, so, uh, uh, wanted to uh, tell you a very, very, very strange story that most people have just never heard. Even though I took a lot of church history in, se in seminary, we only got a, a small portion of this story. And I'm only going to be able to give you a small portion this morning in only 45 minutes that gives you an idea of just how uh, complex this story was, but let's let's see if we can put ourselves in the uh, in the time frame. Uh, Luther, 1517, beginning of the Reformation. Um, Luther, then, of course, a few years later, has his appearance before Charles V, the Emperor. Uh, he has his famous "Here stehe ich kann nicht anders Gott helfe mir." Here I stand; I can do no other. God help me. Uh, situation. Uh, he's kidnapped on his way uh, back to Wittenberg, and uh, uh, Elector Frederick, his protector, hides him out at the Wartburg Castle, and he becomes Knight George and uh, is there for a period of time during which he translates the New Testament uh, into German uh, and uh, is basically sort of running things uh, by letter. He has one quick trip back uh, to Wittenberg because things started getting radical. Uh, this, is, this is Luther's big fear, is that the Reformation is going to turn into anarchy uh, and that all governmental authority is going to break down because the church and the state are intimately wedded. This is a sacral system. It's been a sacral system in Europe for a thousand years. And Luther is very, very concerned um, that by reforming the church, you're going to end up, people are going to go too far and they're going to destroy culture and everything's going to fall apart. You've got the, the Muslims coming in from uh, the East and, uh, and the, this is a big issue as well. And so Luther goes back to Wittenberg, sort of puts things in order, hides back out at the Wartburg Castle. And then finally he comes to the conclusion he just has to go back to Wittenberg even though it may result in his death. He does. And shortly after he returns to Wittenberg, uh, something very interesting happens. You have the Zwickau prophets show up in Wittenberg. And these are men who claim to be receiving revelation from God. And at first, Luther is, is you know, Luther does not have an immediate rejection of them. He, he says, we need to hear them out. Uh, but eventually uh, realizes that these men are quite heretical in their beliefs. Uh, and will eventually oppose not only them, but because of them, uh, all those who are called Anabaptists. Now this is a term that is used by the enemies of these individuals who are rebaptizers. Everyone of course is baptized upon uh, birth and that baptism into the church and the church's baptismal roles becomes the basis of the tax rolls of the state. So by your baptism into the church you become a citizen of the state. And so if someone comes along and says, stop baptizing your babies, the state has a real problem with this. Uh, and the Anabaptists are, uh, and of course the Anabaptists did not call themselves Anabaptists uh, because they did not view themselves as baptizing again. They view themselves as baptizing properly and rightly and in a Christian fashion for the first time. Um, so that was, a, that was language that was used by their enemies not by, by them uh, themselves as far as their understanding of baptism is concerned. They had other issues as well. Um, in fact, the whole, the whole Anabaptist movement is a, uh, the very use of the term is not overly accurate uh, because you had everything represented. As long as there was just one difference on baptism, you had all sorts of other views about the relationship of church and state and everything else. Um, and so it's uh, sometimes called the Radical Reformation, uh, the Anabaptist movement, uh, but it's a very, 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 very wide movement. Uh, and not all the people within it would have recognized the other people within it as being a part of the same, the same movement. 
Well, uh, make a long story short, um, I'm, I'm really having to, to move quickly. Um, so in the early 1530s, uh, you, you have uh, the development of a, uh, a movement uh, in Strasbourg under a man by the name of Melchior Hoffman. And Hoffman is a pacifist. Many of the Anabaptists were pacifists. Uh, many of the pacifist movements today trace their origins back to Anabaptist origins. Because one, one of the traits of many of the Anabaptists was rejection of the sword, rejection of the authority of the state. There had to be a free church. Um, and they were ahead of many others in that, that particular perspective. And so uh, Melchior uh, Hoffman, uh, uh, not only gathered quite a, a, a following, but um, there began to be eschatology associated with the Anabaptist movement and the soon coming of Christ. And initially this was focused upon the city of Strasbourg. Strasbourg was where the reformer Martin Bootser was. It was a uh, uh, sort of open, uh, we'd use the term affirming, but for different reasons today, uh, free city. Uh, and that led to uh, people fleeing there from persecution in other places, such as in Zurich. Many of the Anabaptists ended up going to places um, uh, uh, like Strasbourg. Well, Melchior Hoffman had a convert, a person who uh, began to uh, take prominence in his movement by the name of Jan Mathis. Jan Mathis. Now today, this morning, you're going to hear about the two Jans and the two Bernards. Okay? The two Jans and the two Bernards. Uh, Jan Mathis is a man who looks like he walked right off of the cover of a 1970s Led Zeppelin album. Okay? Uh, we're talking long black robe, long beard, uh, put a guitar in his hand, you could not tell the difference. Um, uh, we're, we're talking a tall gaunt. I mean, if you want to talk about a weird-looking prophet guy, uh, Jan Mathis would be your weird-looking prophet guy, all right? Um, then we're, then we're going to find out about Jan of Leiden, who takes over for Jan Mathis later on. And then we have two Bernards, Bernard Rothman and Bernard Nipperdalling. Bernard Rothman is a writer. Uh, he, he sort of was a, a Twitterer before Twitter. Um, he had enough money to have his own printing press, and it was through the distribution of his literature that the movement we're going to talk about really has its birth and its substantiation. And a fellow by the name of Bernard Nipperdalling, uh, who becomes uh, the mayor of Munster, which is where all of this is going to be uh, taken, uh, taking place. So, two Bernards, two Yans. So, what happens? Well, there is a prophecy circling around that Christ is going to return in the early 1530s to Strasbourg. And so there's a lot of excitement amongst people. And Anabaptism is growing primarily amongst the people of the, uh, of the uh, countryside. Uh, what had happened only a few years earlier, in 1525, you've got to remember, a very, very important event is the uh, Peasants' Revolt that took place in 1525. Over 100,000 peasants slaughtered. This is where Luther lost the peasants. Um, he supported the government. Again, Luther is against anarchy. Uh, and there's still a lot of hurt. Uh, and of course, there's a there's a uh, expectation. Something must be happening. Hundred thousand people have died. Just just imagine how many people that would be, and and uh, and all, all the grieving, the loss, and and starvation, and and uh, the taxation upon the peasants, and so on and so forth. And so there's a lot of underlying discontent with the rulers and the princes at this point in time. And so it's pretty easy to uh, sell uh, copies of the late great planet Earth at this particular point in time in, in history. Don't worry, it wasn't around that. It's been around a long time, but not quite that long. Um, but you can get people eschatologically excited at this particular point in time. And so um, what happens is Munster uh, is a rather wealthy uh, city in northern Germany. Uh, not far from, uh, from the Netherlands and places like that. Uh, it is a uh, heavily fortified city, a very thick wall, um, uh, lots of shopkeepers and, and merchants and skilled artisans and things like that within the city walls of, of Munster. 
And Munster has uh, uh, a large Lutheran population. Uh, the Lutherans basically take over and uh, declare Munster to be a, a uh, reformed city. The prince bishop, uh, the Roman Catholic prince bishop uh, of the city, uh, has a wife and kids, so he's not really all that committed to this Roman Catholic thing. And so he's, he's willing to sort of deal a little bit with the, uh, with the, with the Lutherans and sort of allow, you know, uh, he's got a long name. I'm just going to call him the Prince Bishop. But it was Bishop Franz von Waldeck. That's just sort of hard to say many, many times in only 45 minutes. So um, uh, he's allowing this to happen, even though he's still, quote unquote, the Catholic bishop that rules over Munster. Well, what happens is uh, a, a fairly large number of Anabaptists begin to arrive in Munster, and eventually they uh, have so many arrive. Uh, that they are able to start shifting the, the balance of power within Munster itself. And um, so the, the prophecy uh, uh, of the followers of Hoffman in Strasbourg falls apart in 1532 because he had said that, one was gonna, that was when it was going to happen. So what happens is some of these people go from Strasbourg to Munster and as they start to become uh, a fairly large part of the population and it's a democratic process, uh, calls start going out. Christ is returning, uh, but he's going to set up his kingdom in Munster, not in Strasbourg. We were just off by just a little bit. And so uh, Anabaptists begin flocking to Munster in, 15, uh, 50, in February of 1533. It had become a Lutheran city. However, um, in, uh, 15, during the rest of the course of 1533, uh, Bernard Rothman of Munster begins writing these pamphlets that starts attracting people to come to Munster. And this is how the, sort of the population shift uh, begins to, to change. And so, uh, amazingly uh, enough, fairly quickly, uh, the Anabaptists are able to take control of the city government. And what's different is Hoffman in Strasbourg was a complete pacifist, no sword, no anything. The form of Anabaptism, if we want to call it that, once you see what actually ends up happening, I don't know what we call this, um, the, the form of religion that takes root amongst these Anabaptists in, in Munster um, immediately sheds the uh, no use of the sword uh, kind of, of, of belief. And fairly uh, quickly, uh, things begin to, to change. And so what happens, uh, Lutheranism isn't far enough. We've got to go toward uh, Anabaptism. And so uh, eventually the Anabaptists uh, take over. Nipperdaling becomes the mayor of Munster. Uh, after he kicks the Lutherans out. Uh, and so right around this time, in uh, early 1534, Jan Mathis shows up in Munster. Remember, the guy who's the refugee from the Led Zeppelin album. And um, uh, Jan Mathis has pretty much a direct line to God. Um, literally, uh, someone would ask Jan Mathis a question. And Jan Mathis would stop and he would, yes, Lord, yes, okay, what about, okay, uh -huh. all right. The Lord says, uh, so he would have been a smash hit on TBN. I mean, he would have had prime time, uh, they, he would have kicked Paula White off of TBN and would have just taken over the whole thing. And so uh, he has a... He has revelations from God, and he uh, decides that Munster is the new Jerusalem. And uh, so everybody that had been thinking about going to Strasbourg or had gone to Strasbourg or something like that, Jan Mathis is now telling everyone Munster is the place, and Bernard Rothman is writing up, he's a very good writer, he's writing up these pamphlets, and he's railing against Roman Catholicism, and against the sacraments, all the rest of the stuff, but then he's adding in these Anabaptist things and calling people to come to uh, Munster. And so in a short period of time, uh, Mathis is, is only in uh, Munster for literally a matter of, uh, of weeks uh, before he basically takes over uh, and uh, around uh, early January 1534, 
they decide that if you're going to be in the city, uh, you need to be an Anabaptist. If this is going to be the New Jerusalem, then everybody needs to be a true follower of Jesus. And the Catholics obviously are not, and now the Lutherans are not either, even though they had been their allies at first. And so um, on one day, over a thousand adults were uh, rebaptized in, uh, in Munster uh, in January of 1534. And so in uh, early February of 1534, um, Jan Mathis, along with a young man who had some military experience but was basically an actor. He, he acted in plays and things like that. A very strikingly handsome young man by the name of Jan of Leiden. Uh, Jan becomes uh, sort of the second in command under Jan Mathis uh, here in the developing uh, story at uh, at Munster. And so uh, the pressure is becoming more and more strong on the remaining Catholics and Lutherans uh, in, in Munster. They call on the Prince Bishop, hey, protect our rights. This isn't how we do things here. You said we would all be free to do what we wanted to do. Uh, of course, the Prince Bishop sends letters and stuff like that. But what ends up happening is at the end of February on a bitterly cold day, a bitterly cold day, and they can have bitterly cold days in Munster, Germany. Uh, Jan Mathis expels everyone but true believers. You had a choice. You either be baptized um, and become an Anabaptist, or you leave, and you leave your you're only allowed to take so much stuff with you. You can't take a bunch of carts with all your riches and your clothes and everything because there's some fairly wealthy people in Munster. Uh, he expels all but the true believers on this bitterly cold day in uh, February of 1534. So as a result, uh, the Prince Bishop besieges the city. He, he gets his soldiers uh, and he encircles Munster uh, and he sets up a siege of, of the city. And so this begins uh, in, in February of 1534 and it's going to last into 1535. So it's going to last for a lengthy period of time. Now, what takes place over the next few weeks is just amazing. Um, I, I'm not making any of this up. You can verify it. I was just looking, unfortunately, in the volumes that Nick Needham has. I was just looking. looking. You actually have two sets of, of that in the library back there. He doesn't go into Munster. He doesn't go into the Anabaptists. But uh, you can uh, you can get a book called Taylor King uh, that will uh, give you this whole story in rather full full detail. Um, what happens is the 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 climate of fear and control uh, starts to build fairly quickly within the walls of the city. Um, Jan Mathis has to have absolute control. Uh, Mathis and Leiden over the next couple of months will set up, in essence, a communist system. Uh, everyone is to turn in uh, all of their property, uh, all of their gold, all of their clothing. Uh, a common store is to be set up and anything that you need as far as food, uh, clothing will be, everybody gets it all from the same place. So everyone's supposed to be equal. And uh, Jan Mathis, of course, you, you, now all of a sudden the shopkeepers are having to learn how to do guard duty because you've got the Prince Bishop's forces out there. They're expecting to be attacked at any time. And so you're having to put everybody into military order. And, you know, uh, the women are taught how to repair breaches in the walls and how to boil stuff and pour it over on soldiers over the walls and, and uh, all of this kind of stuff. It becomes a communist military camp, in essence. What's interesting is their primary scriptural text is the Old Testament. There was very little reference to the New Testament at all uh, in Munster during this time period. They, they took as their guidance um, Old Testament stories of, you know, the various sieges and, and uh, uh, warfare and, and um, eventually some other things, all, all taken primarily from uh, the Old Testament, very little from the, the New Testament. Um, early on, there is a uh, blacksmith by the name of Herbert Rusher who uh, thought he was amongst friends. He's on guard duty uh, only a few weeks after Jan Mathis has sort of taken over as prophet of the city. And he's not happy about what's going on. And he says some negative things uh, concerning uh, this new Jan Mathis prophet guy. 
uh, rather derogatory statements. Well, some people report him. He thought everybody around him was his friend, but this idea of fear and control is already taking place. And so he is bound and brought before Jan Mathis in the city square and the city gathers around. And Jan Mathis begins to preach about the need for everyone to believe the same thing and to follow God's prophets and so on and so forth. And, and it becomes clear pretty quickly that he's talking about executing uh, the blacksmith. And so people in the, in, the, uh, in the congregation are like, well, wait a minute, we have, we have laws. And you, there has to be trial, and there has to, you know, there's, there's all sorts of stuff that has to, has to happen here. And uh, so uh, some men come forward. Jan Mathis has them arrested and dragged off to jail. And so here's, here's the, the blacksmith uh, bound uh, on his knees in front of Jan Mathis. The stories differ, uh, but um, some people say Jan Mathis did, some say said, said it was uh, Jan of Leiden um, that stepped up to do it, but e eventually someone takes one of those long pikes, uh, one of the two of them, and stabs him in the back. Well, you would think that would be enough for most of us, but blacksmiths are very hardy people. And so he is laying there on the ground moaning and screaming, and he, but he's not dead, he wasn't killed. And so Jan of Leiden takes someone's pistol, you know, they're the one-shot black powder type pistols, and shoots him point blank in the head. He still doesn't die. Uh, he is picked up and carried off to his home, dies eight days later. Now the whole city has seen this. And so this is the establishment of the fear culture, and you must follow the prophet, and whatever the prophet says, uh, you must do. Well, uh, Easter comes along, and uh, at a wedding, uh, shortly before, uh, right, right before Easter, at a wedding, uh, Jan Mathis falls into one of, he would fall into these sort of, very similar to the descriptions of Muhammad when he would receive uh, the, the surahs of the Quran. Uh, into, into this fit, well, uh, and, and he's gone. And everybody's like, you know, is a, a revelation's coming, something's gonna happen. And uh, when he comes to, he's going, yes, Father, yes, Father, your will be done, yes, Father. And he gets up, and he smiles, and he kisses everybody goodbye. And so Jan of Leiden and the other leaders, secondary leaders, you know, they, they try to talk to him, find out what's going on. And basically what happens is uh, Jan Mathis reveals that God has told him uh, to take, the numbers differ, but let's say about a, a dozen men, and to ride out, um, and he will, with a dozen men, destroy the Prince Bishop's army. Just 12 men. Uh, they will destroy the Prince Bishop's army by the power of God. And so uh, on Easter, uh, the gates of the city swing open and out run, out rides this elderly man, Jan, Jan Mathis, uh, with 12, 12 of his hand-picked men, and they start toward the Prince Bishop's lines. And so the whole city is up on the wall uh, watching this, expecting to see the deliverance of God. And out from the Prince Bishops, you know, the Prince Bishop sees these guys coming, and about 500 of his cavalry, because uh, there's, there's probably 8,000 men out here, uh, 500 of his cavalry respond and come from the other side. And as you can imagine, it was a very, very short battle. Uh, Jan Mathis is immediately disemboweled um, in the battle, uh, run through with a spear, and and uh, that night, you know, they, the Prince Bishop's army eventually is going to put his head on a pike and plant it outside the, the city gates. Other parts of his body are nailed the, the, to the wall later that night, um, and uh, everyone's wiped out. Just, well, you can imagine that was just pretty much is going to be it, right? They're just going to open the doors and say, sorry, whoops. Uh, mm. Well, that night, uh, interestingly enough, this is the sad part, uh, the story started circulating around within Munster that uh, Jan Mathis was going to rise from the dead on the third day. And so that night, uh, the people are called into the city square, up on the second floor, 
of Nipper Darling's home. The, the, the door is open. There's bright light behind. Oh, I forgot. Jan Mathis was married to this gorgeous woman who always, well, when Mathis was alive, was always dressed like he in black, but now she comes out in this white robe, and who is with her but Jan of Leiden? And Jan starts off by saying, you know, talking about Jan Mathis, who was a prophet of God, however, he deserved what he got. Because as Nipper Darling here will tell you, I had a vision days ago of what was going to happen because Jan Mathis became arrogant. And he wasn't supposed to take those men with him. If he hadn't taken the men with him, he would have been victorious. But he became arrogant. He took those men with him. And so, so God has judged him. And so who now takes over with this amazing... Because he had to quash the idea of the resurrection. So, so uh, Jan Mathis has been judged. And now Jan of Leiden uh, is, is taking his place and is in control of what's going on. Shortly after this, the Prince Bishop tries to take the city. Um, <laughs> the first attempt, <laughs> the first attempt, they're getting ready to go. Uh, they've got these big guns that have been brought in called the Devil and the Devil's Mother. Um, and these big cannons, and they'd fire at the walls, but the women uh, in Munster had become expert at filling the walls back up with dirt and mud and excrement and all sorts of stuff like that. And, and so they had been bombarding the city, and they're, they're going to attack the next day, but they've got a bunch of mercenaries with them. And the mercenaries, what do mercenaries do? They drink a lot. And so a whole group of mercenaries had just get, been getting themselves absolutely soused. And they uh, became so drunk that at, they were, were going to attack at sunrise. But as the sun was setting, they became confused, thinking that it was the next morning already, and they were going to miss out on all the booty in the city, so they start heading toward the city. And so the other people see them heading toward the city. Did we not get the note? We don't want them to get all the booty. And so there's this completely disorganized attack at sunset, so it's getting darker and darker. You've got to try to get across a moat and up walls. They get slaughtered. They just get wiped out. And so Jan is leading the, the defense, uh, and he's very brave. He doesn't care about uh, cannonballs flying by or anything else. And so this only helps to establish his leadership. And so uh, around these times, uh, now, it, again, doing this too fast, but some of the things that happen over the next number of months, uh, Jan of Leiden establishes polygamy. Now these are, these are Anabaptists. They are, they are like as straight-laced as you can get. And so to all of a sudden say there should be no unmarried women anywhere in the city, um, just really causes a rebellion. And for a while he is arrested and put in prison. There is a successful rebellion. But the people didn't think through how they were going to communicate with the Prince Bishop's men. And so it gave time for Jan of Leiden's faithful followers to regroup and to get Jan of Leiden out. And they, of course, then executed all of the revolutionaries. But Jan proves himself. He, he takes, I think, eventually 16 wives. Um, and he proves himself to be an absolutely ruthless, ruthless um, uh, leader uh, in, in Munster. Um, and uh, some of the things that were going on, that the Anabaptists would sneak out at night and do sneak attacks on the Prince Bishop's men. They were still, they, the, the, the cordon was still porous enough. They were able to get Bernard Rothman's tracks out. They were trying to get Anabaptists to come. Uh, Anabaptist groups of thousands of Anabaptists tried to get to Munster and would, were slaughtered on the way uh, by various um, uh, governmental entities uh, that, that stood in the way of their coming. But they, they did try to come, and they were calling for them to come. Uh, during this time, for example, uh, a young woman, a 15-year-old young woman, came to Jan of Leiden and said, uh, I will go to the Prince Bishop, and I will fool him, and I will poison him, and I will kill him, following Old Testament stories, you know, uh, of what happened. And so that she's given this beautiful clothing, and uh, she is given, they, they make a poisoned shirt 
that she is to give to the prince bishop uh, as she tries to seduce him. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, other people in the city knew about it, and someone escaped from the city at the same time and told the prince bishop's people. And so she has appeared before the prince bishop. She was actually making progress, but then this guy shows up and says, by the way, there's this chick, and here's her story, and here's the reality. And so uh, she is put on the wheel. I don't know if you know what uh, torture on the wheel is, but they would attach this wheel, and well, well, they went, well, actually it was a sort of a cross thing, and they'd take uh, wheels from wagons, and they would break all of your bones on your legs and your arms, called being broken on the wheel. Um, and uh, they have broken her on the wheel, and yet she, she remains firm, you have no authority over me, and the executioner says, we'll see about that, and lops off her head. Um, and so uh, the, the Prince Bishop, by the way, as people were trying to escape from Munster, there were people who tried to get out, um, was not letting them in, was not letting them through his lines. They'd be stuck in an in, a, in, a, in between, there was an in-between area between the walls, because the, the Munsterites had cannon too. So the, the Prince Bishop's guys had to be far enough away. It became a dead zone where people just dying of the cold or starvation or things like that. And interestingly enough, some of the uh, Prince Bishop's men snuck into Munster and joining the Anabaptists, uh, which was an odd thing, but it, it did happen a, a number of times. Well, Jan of Leiden starts getting really strange. Uh, there is this goldsmith that shows up one day and he has a revelation that Jan needs to be king, and so he becomes uh, anointed as king, and he has his whole court, and, and all the rest of this stuff, and everybody else still has to live in a communist style, but he's getting to do all this stuff with the king and his court and his 16 wives, and, and uh, this one wife, um, a uh, young, beautiful uh, woman rebels against the command to polygamy. She won't marry this old guy she's supposed to marry. And so Jan puts her in jail for one day and then takes her out and marries, him, marries her himself. And she's really, really pretty. Uh, but she has a real independent mind. And so she becomes really troubled at the fact that she's eating good and the people are starting to eat really, really bad because the city's been surrounded for quite some time and they're, they're running through their stock of food. Um, and so she dares to say something about it in public in front of Jan of Leiden. And so Jan has the entire city gathered together, and he preaches a sermon. He has his wives right there, and he commands that she put her head on the, on the block, and he commands his wives to sing uh, hymns. Uh, one of their favorite hymns, I don't want to ruin the hymn for, him for you, it was A Mighty Fortress, uh, borrowed from Martin Luther, who, by the way, had correspondence with them and told them they were all a bunch of heretics going to hell. Uh, and by the fact of what they were doing, they were demonstrating that they were not followers of Christ and, and everything else, because Luther saw this was, his, this, was his, this was his worst nightmare. This was exactly what he, he knew that the entire Reformation movement would be accused of really wanting to be these crazy people in Munster. Um, and so he has his wives standing around um, singing hymns while he takes out his sword and lops off her head right there in front of everybody. Um, there were executions going on in Munster pretty much every single day. Uh, and they were gruesome executions. A um, lot of beheading, but breaking on the wheel, so on and so forth. So, so you've got the forces outside, but then you have this, this, this stuff going on. You've got polygamy, and you've got uh, new revelations, and you've, you've got this massive amount of fear. And starvation is, is increasing uh, in, in, the, in the city. Um, it, it is... It is absolutely an amazing thing to, to, to also talk about. There is a, a, a later attack. The Prince Bishop tries again. Prince Bishop, he's having to borrow money. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to blow all of Munster up. That's his city. That's, that, that's the only, only way he's going to be able to pay off all these loans is there's something left. Um, but eventually he's put under enough pressure, not only by Catholics, but by Protestants as well, saying, you can't allow this to go on. If you continue to allow this to happen, this could happen elsewhere. We could have complete chaos. 
And so a second attack is made upon Munster, and uh, this time without any drunk people starting off in, at, at, uh, at sunset. Uh, and yet still, uh, because of the, the difficulty of the moat and the walls and the, the stunning uh, skill, uh, Leiden, Jan of Leiden really trained the people very, very well. He knew what he was doing. He was a bright guy. He was crazy, but he was a bright guy. Um, they, they repulsed the, uh, the attack with very few losses to themselves and major losses to the Prince Bishop's men. And so he just decides, well, the only way we're going to do this is he starts building a massive wall outside the range of the cannons of, of Munster, and he's just simply going to seal the place off and just wait them out. That's all, that's all that can be done. And they see the construction of this happening. And so they know what's coming, especially uh, over the winter as the food starts to become more and more scarce. They, they know what is, what is, what is coming. Um, so, to, to, again, with, with only the few minutes that, that, we, that we have left, um, in uh, June of 1535, things are in bad, bad shape. But they're still resisting. They're still holding on. How? I can't even begin to imagine. I mean, think about what it was like. Almost daily executions. The population has, has, has gone down a great deal. Even in the final battle, the women of Munster, weakened with starvation, are going to fight uh, against the Prince Bishops. Instead of seeing them as saviors, they're, they're, they're going to fight. Uh, everybody will. It's, it's, it's stunning. Uh, the, just looking at the, the parallels between this and Waco are, are many when you went to think about it. Um, uh, just on a much grander scale is what happened in, in Munster. Anyways, there was a... A fellow by the name of Henry Gressback. Now, uh, before the city was completely cut off, uh, Jan of Leiden had sent out 12 apostles. And most of them had been killed almost instantly. But one was the former schoolmaster, and he could speak Latin. And he, uh, once he was arrested, uh, impressed the prince bishop uh, and offered to help him because he knew all the city's defenses. He knew what the passwords were to the various places and things like that. And so finally in, in June, he uh, leads some of the prince bishop's men into the city and proves that, that he's not lying. They're able to get in and get out again without much difficulty and so an attack is planned with with Henry Gressback's uh, uh, assistance and he he brings about 300 men uh, into the city uh, but then they get discovered and so there's this running battle from one part of the city to another part of the city uh, as the Anabaptists realize they're there and so the battle begins and there's not enough men uh, that have infiltrated to uh, to really defeat uh, all the people that are still left in there uh, but there's there's chaos and as a result uh, the Anabaptists that are guarding the wall go inward to fight the people inside and so one of the uh, Prince Bishop's men manages to sneak away and get through the city up on the wall and, and takes the Prince Bishop's colors and he's now, 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 and here comes the entire army into, uh, into the city. Uh, amazingly, Jan had had the equivalent of ancient tanks built. Uh, armored uh, wagons with cannons on them uh, in the city center and there was quite the battle uh, to try to subdue these people but eventually they're simply overwhelmed by weight of numbers and there is a massive wholesale slaughter uh, the Prince Bishop's men basically wipe everybody up man woman and child uh, in, in Munster. There's almost nobody left. But uh, orders have been, have been given. Do not kill Jan of Leiden. We need to make an example of Jan of Leiden. So Jan is uh, captured along with Bart, uh, Bernard Nipperdalling. And uh, a year later, uh, after Munster has been uh, taken, uh, the trial has taken place, and approximately a year later, um, well, actually it was six months, so it was January, January 22nd, if you want to put this on your calendar, celebrate Munster Execution Day. Um, <laughs> January 22nd, 1536, three men are brought into the city square of Munster, and the Prince Bishop is sitting up on Bernard Nipperdalling's 
the same place where Jan of Leiden had walked out and said, you know, Jan Mathis was, was uh, you know, judged properly, and that's when he became king and stuff like that. Uh, the Prince Bishop is up there, he's watching, and a uh, structure has been built uh, that has a, a single pole in the center. And what you can do is you can, you can uh, uh, attach three men to this pole uh, in the center. And uh, you can't see the other guys, but you can hear and smell them. Um, and uh, they are to be executed, and this was part of law at the time. This was not something they came up with for this. This was, this was a different time. Uh, if you're squeamish, just hold on a second. Um, basically, the law was you were to be tortured for 60 minutes. And at the end of 60 minutes, uh, you were to be stabbed in the heart. But you had to be conscious for 60 minutes. So if you passed out from pain, they would rev they'd stop the clock uh, and revive you. And OK, he's awake. OK, start the torture again and start the clock again. You had to go through 60 minutes of this torture. And the torture basically was they had a, um, you know, uh, what they, a big pot of, of glowing coals, and they have all sorts of metal instruments, uh, tongs and stuff like that, uh, glowing in that, and they basically just rip you apart. Uh, they rip your muscles off, and your lips off, and your ears off, and poke you in the eyes, and do stuff like that. Uh, and they kill you in the most painful possible way, publicly, in front of everybody. Then, then, uh, and they do it one at a time. So they do it to the first guy, they did it to Jan of Leiden first. And so the other two guys are sitting there listening to this, knowing that they're next. I mean, it's an incredible, and everybody, this was a public spectacle. This was, this was how, and everybody in Europe agreed to this. Reformers, Catholics, everybody agreed to this. The name Anabaptist became a swear word in Europe after Munster. Even the, even the peaceful uh, people who eschewed the sword, if you were attached to that name, that's why there were Baptist martyrs well into the 1700s in Holland. Because they were viewed as, we know what you're really like. We saw it at Munster. We know what you're really like. Uh, amazing number of people. Not only the thousands that died in Munster, and the thousands that died trying, trying to get to Munster, but the thousands who would die afterwards as a result of Munster. Now, if you want to know how deeply this got into the psyche, um, once they were dead, the Prince Bishop had three extremely sturdy cages built and put their corpses in these cages and hung them on the side of St. Lambert's Cathedral spire in the center of Munster where those bodies hung there, putrefying and dropping pieces of flesh on people for the next 50 years. Then they took the cages down, took the bones out, and put the cages back up. Now, during World War II, that spire was hit by a bomb, an Allied bomb. Uh, two of the three cages fell down. They repaired them when they repaired the spire. And if you take your phone out right now, go to Google Earth, Go down to the street view and zoom into St. Lambert's Cathedral, Munster, Germany, and spin around it. You look up on the side of that. Just, just put in Munster, Germany cages on Google Images. And hanging there right now at this moment in Munster, Germany, are the three cages that contain the bodies of Jan of Leiden, uh, Bernard Nipperdaling, and, and one other fellow that were executed in 1535, January 22nd. You got it right there? Uh, January 22nd, 1535. They're still there. They had a public vote in 2000 and, you know, 2002 or 2008. They had a public vote as to whether they should be taken down. The people voted to keep them there. In a secular Germany today. I hope to see them. I'm visiting Munster in uh, January, yeah, late January, early February. I really hope to get some pictures myself. Uh, that is how deeply impacted the European psyche was by the rebellion at Munster. 
Now, there were all sorts of stories there that I didn't get to go into because we had to do it super, 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 super fast. Lots of lessons I can't even talk about. But I will say this, that has got to be the weirdest story in all of church history. There is no question about it. Um, how these peaceful, pacifistic Anabaptists ended up being taken over by someone like a Jan Mathis, Jan of Leiden, says a lot about centrality of scripture and balance in regards to authority and revelate. There's, there's lots of lessons that I would normally spend the time to apply, but we have run out of time. Um, but as I said, if you want to read more, uh, there is uh, the, the, the book that I would suggest called Taylor King, T-A-I-L-O-R, Taylor King. Uh, there are a couple others, not too many. It is an amazingly non-discussed uh, element of church history uh, that is that I don't know why a movie hasn't been made of it. You would not have to exaggerate a single thing. You would not have to make up a single fictional thing. If you just stuck with the historical story, it would be a blockbuster. Uh, but it hasn't happened yet. I'm not really uh, exactly sure why. Uh, but there is the story of Munster. Uh, lessons to be learned. Uh, but we are out of time, and I trust me, I will not be talking anything about Munster during the morning service. So if you're concerned about that, you do not have to be. We will do something called exegesis uh, for the morning service. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we'll see you in the service.